Welcome to the National Ballpark Museum and Stacy Nelson, your tour guide for today. She has some interesting stories to tell you about some of these old ballparks. Enjoy Stacy Nelson and we hope to see you in our museum soon. Well, hi there and welcome to the National Ballpark Museum. My name is Stacy Nelson and I'm a docent here at the Ballpark Museum and I was just enjoying a book called The Colorado Curveball by David A. Kelly. We're going to talk about him a little bit more, but while you're here, I'd like to have you come join me for a tour of the Ballpark Museum. Um, the National Ballpark Museum kind of prides itself in having all kinds of artifacts from the 14 classic ballparks that were built uh, from 1909 to 1915, and then we've included Old Yankee Stadium that was built in 1923. The museum is dedicated to the 14 classic ballparks, and if you listened with me for just a bit, I'm going to say their names. Some of them may seem very familiar to you, and some of them kind of strange names. There's Polo Grounds, Sportsman's Park, Scheib Park, Forbes Field, League Park, Comiskey Park, Griffith Stadium, Crosley Field, Fenway Park, Tiger Stadium, Ebbets Field, Braves Field, and Old Yankee Stadium. To go to any of these parks though, you had to go through what was called a turnstile. And as we go through our tour today, you're gonna to see very, very unique turnstiles, old turnstiles, newer, more modern ones, but they were all key to getting you into the ballpark. But I'm gonna start with a little bit of history about Scheib Park because that is um, the oldest park and it also has our oldest turnstile. I'm sitting in front of some of the memorabilia we have from Scheib Park. Uh, it wasn't always called Scheib Park either. In 1937, its name changed to honor the manager and owner of the team, Philadelphia Athletics. Scheib Park is in Philadelphia and their manager owner, Cornelius McGillicuddy, is what they named the stadium after, but he's more commonly known as Connie Mack. So Connie Mack Stadium and a lot of Connie Mack Little Leaves still exist today. So to get into any ballpark, you had to go through a turnstile. And the National Ballpark Museum has several turnstiles from these ballparks. And that's gonna kind of be a little bit of our marker as we go through today's tour. But I'm standing here next to Scheib Park's turnstile from 1909, making this 111 years old. If you look at it carefully, you guys see it's, it moves or pivots on a post, and on the top is a ticket counter. The whole idea of a turnstile was to control the flow of people going in, but they also needed to know how many, and so this helped keep track of how many people came in to watch a game. The Scheid Park turnstile does have some wonderful features. There is a break at the base that the usher would use to control again the flow of the people. But if you look carefully here, you'll notice there's a bar, a lower bar, that you're not gonna see on any of the other turnstiles because they saw that sometimes small children were crawling underneath and they needed to keep track of them and also count them and get a ticket for them. The day after Scheib Park opened, Forbes Field in Pittsburgh opened and it was also built and constructed out of steel and concrete. And this turnstile is from Forbes Field. If you look at it carefully, you'll notice it does have that ticket counter on top but it's missing the top and maybe some lucky souvenir hunter may have that. But at the bottom, they don't have that bar to keep the children away, but there is the break that kind of controls that flow of people. A little bit of history about Forbes Field. In 1960, the Pittsburgh Pirates beat the New York Yankees in that World Series in seven games. But a very special moment happened when Bill Mazeroski hit a walk-off home run to win the World Series for the Pittsburgh Pirates. Hi there, we are at turnstile number three here. And if you look at this turnstile, it's pretty old because we are at Crosley Field where the Cincinnati Reds played. The Cincinnati Reds were the first Major League Baseball team. And this turnstile here, if you notice, is missing something pretty key on top. That ticket counter is missing. And again, I think a lucky souvenir hunter may have that somewhere in his home. 
But you'll notice a lot of red here as Crosley Field, built in 1912, was home of the Cincinnati Reds. Previous to that, they played at a wonderful place called the Palace of the Fans, which honestly looked like a palace. It had all kinds of decorative features. So behind me, we have an actual locker from Crosley Field. It's kind of crude, but it contains many items from the great Cincinnati Reds catcher, Johnny Bench. You'll notice we've got his mitt, we've got his batting helmet and jersey, all of them signed. And there's even a model bronze cast of his hands holding a bat. Johnny Bench is one of the only players to hit 1,000 RBIs, runs batted in. I introduce you to Mr. Red here. If you look at this very, very formal uniform that he's wearing, he would have been an usher taking your tickets or showing you to your seats. But what's really unique about the usher uniforms that you'll see at the National Ballpark Museum is they are very formal. Can you imagine wearing all of this and watching a baseball game? Today's ushers, their uniforms are a little different, a lot more casual. Maybe those khaki pants like Jake wears from State Farm, and then a team shirt or pullover with the colors from the team that they are working for. Okay, another historical moment that we're gonna talk about happened at Crosley Field, the very first night game that was played on June 14th in 1935 when the Cincinnati Reds played the Philadelphia Phillies. That game drew over 20,000 people, but the whole idea of playing a game under the lights was really special. And here at the National Ballpark Museum, we have one of those lights that hung at that first night game. Well, I'm at one of my favorite parts of the whole National Ballpark Museum. I love baseball and all of these wonderful places where baseball history has happened. But we also have something very special for all of you girls, because I'm standing next to the uniform worn by Jackie Mitchell. Jackie Mitchell was a 17-year-old pitcher who signed a contract with the Chattanooga Lookouts, who were a class AA minor league baseball team. The owner of the Chattanooga Lookouts was always looking for ways to get media coverage and to bring people in to watch his team. And he established an exhibition game, kind of a practice game, with the New York Yankees. He had heard about Jackie Mitchell and he signed her to a contract. Well, the idea of a young girl, a woman, playing against the New York Yankees, pitching no less against these great New York Yankees, drew the people in. And she is known in history as being the only woman to have struck out Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig in just seven pitches. Now some people think Babe Ruth really wasn't trying so hard. And maybe that was the case. But Lou Gehrig, he was a competitor through and through and he gave it his all and she struck him out. We have some wonderful books about Jackie Mitchell that you can find here at the museum to read or at your local library. We've moved in the museum now to an area for Tiger Stadium and I'm standing next to a more modern turnstile that was used at Tiger Stadium and the ticket counter is inside this little window here. But again, it was important to count all the people who came into the stadium. As part of the exhibit of Tiger Stadium, we have a very special bat. Many patrons who come to the museum come here just to see this bat. But in 1971, the All-Star Game was played at Detroit and Reggie Jackson hit a home run for the ages. He wasn't even scheduled to play in that All-Star Game, but another player, Tony Oliva, was injured. And so Reggie Jackson came to bat in the third inning and hit a home run 370 feet past right field, another 100 feet past the generator at the base of the stadium until it hit a light tower. That light tower may have stopped one of the longest home runs ever hit, but we have the bat right over Now we're gonna talk about Sportsman's Park. Sportsman's Park was in St. Louis, and I'm sitting next to one of the turnstiles from that great ballpark. Sportsman's Park hosted more Major League Baseball games than any other ballpark in history, and had games until 1966. But what's really unique about Sportsman's Park is that it was the home 
to not one, but two teams from St. Louis, the St. Louis Browns and the St. Louis Cardinals. But if you look at this uniform here closely, you'll notice one very unique feature, and that's that it was a zipper top, very different and only used by this team. When we started our tour, and I named the 14 classic ballparks that we have items from here at the ballpark museum, I mentioned Fenway Park. Fenway Park is one of two ballparks of those classics that still hosts Major League Baseball games today. Fenway Park is home of the Boston Red Sox and also home of our author, David Kelly, whose book I was enjoying at the beginning. We have several big items here from Fenway Park. I have my friend here, Mr. Red Sox, in a more casual usher's uniform. Behind me is a great big green slab known as the Green Monster. The Green Monster was part of left field to center field at Fenway Park. And in fact, it is still there, but it was a much bigger obstacle for hitters. We have one small section of that green monster. And in fact, if you were to come up here and run your hand across it, you would feel the dents of the number of balls that hit and struck this part of the wall. There are 89 dents just in this one section of the green monster. I'm standing here holding a Jimmy Fund collection box from Fenway Park. It was suggested to the owners to become involved in some different fundraising in, with outside organizations. The Children's Cancer Research Foundation was decided upon. And during this time on a radio show, a young cancer patient named Jimmy happened to call in to talk about his love of baseball. All the dots were connected. Instead of calling it the Children's Cancer Research Foundation, they came up with a simpler name, Jimmy's Fund, and the response was overwhelming. People called in donating all kinds of money, and these collection boxes were put throughout Fenway Park where fans could just drop in a dollar bill here or there or some of their loose change. To this day, there are still Jimmy Fund collection boxes at Fenway Park. Here at the museum though, we do have a display that honors the Negro Leagues and uh, some of the wonderful players. Behind me are two bronze casts of a couple of the greats that played in the Negro Leagues. John Buck O'Neill and Double Duty Radcliffe were two great hitters in the Negro Leagues. Another ballpark that I mentioned at the beginning was Ebbets Field, and Ebbets Field was built in New York and home of the Brooklyn Dodgers. We have some, just a few items from Ebbets Field. I'm standing next to a display case that houses a light bulb from its first night game. Other items we have from Ebbets Field is a brass railing here at the ticket window that you would see, and we have a nice picture behind it that shows that exact railing there. Also, a wonderful part of the light fixture that was very unique in the rotunda or the entryway of the stadium. If you look closely, there are two bats that are crossed, and this was all part of a giant chandelier that hung in the center of the rotunda. I just made the greatest catch, like Willie Mays in 1954. We're here at the Polo Grounds. The Polo Grounds was a, a name given to multiple ballparks that were built because, well, if you can think, the first ones were made of wood and they burned down, but the Polo Grounds built in 1911 was finally constructed out of steel and concrete and home to the New York Giants. Willie Mays' incredible catch over his shoulder in right field is one of baseball's greatest moments, the 1954 World Series. Another one is the shot heard around the world, where in 1951, Bobby Thompson hit a home run, a game-winning home run for the New York Giants as they went on to win the National League pin. So back at the bottom of that list of names of these 14 classic ballparks, I said Old Yankee Stadium. Old Yankee Stadium was built in 1923 and is often called the house that Ruth built. And ballpark mystery number two, the pinstripe ghost is all about the ghost of Babe Ruth. And some shenanigans at Yankee Stadium. I just came through yet another turnstile 
into a side room we have here for Wrigley Field. It is the other stadium still in existence today that hosts Major League Baseball games and it is home of the beloved Chicago Cubs. I'm laying on an actual on-deck circle from Wrigley Field. This is where the players would stand before it was their turn to go to bat. There was a problem with it. It's very slick and whenever there was rain and the players cleats would get on here that sometimes meant trouble. So today's on deck circles are painted onto the turf, onto the grass. But it's very unique that we have an actual on deck circle from Wrigley Field. Well, we're nearing the end of our tour and I'm now standing in front of the entrance sign of Griffith Stadium. Griffith Stadium was built in 1911 and it had several names like some of the others. It was first called National Park and then American League Park. And then in 1923, it was named Griffith Stadium after its owner, Clark Griffith. Griffith Stadium was also home of a Negro League baseball team. The Homestead Grays played their games there and it hosted two Negro League World Series. But there is a tradition of presidents throwing out a ceremonial first pitch. And in 1910, William Taft threw out the very first presidential first pitch. It was at that game though that he did make some other unique kind of history. Because in the seventh inning, needing to kind of just stretch his legs, he stood up and was going through a stretch and everyone around him, seeing the president stand up, didn't feel that they could remain in their seats. They didn't want to embarrass him, so they all stood up. And from then on, the seventh inning stretch became a part of every baseball game. Well, that's just a little taste of what we have here at the National Ballpark Museum. We didn't visit all the stadiums or all the ballparks, but we hope you get a chance to come back and see it all, because there's so much more high and low, hidden behind things for you to enjoy and learn about baseball, the ballparks, and the wonderful players that have made history there.